Welcome to lecture number 39. Today the topic is 4.11, An Age of Reform. The theme is America and Regional Culture. The learning objective is explain how and why various reform movements developed and expanded from 1800 to 1848. The first key concept delves into the causes for reform movements. The rise of democratic and individualistic beliefs, a response to rationalism, and changes to society caused by the market revolution, along with greater social and geographical mobility, contributed to moral and social reforms and inspired utopian and other religious movements. The response to rationalism again refers to the growing transcendentalist movement in the early 19th century. People are no longer thinking that rationalism and logic are the best approach to improve society. Now they'd rather trust their intuition as a way to guide their lives. What this might look like in practice would be the spread of the message of self-reliance, that one can effect great change based on the effort that they put in. The Second Great Awakening also leads to the reform movement. People are seeking salvation as a result of the Second Great Awakening, and one of the ways in which they do that is through doing good deeds and helping those around them. That will help them cleanse their soul and possibly open the gates of heaven to them. Utopian movements also grow during this time. A utopia is a perfect place on earth, where everything and everyone acts as they should. There were many attempts at utopias in the United States in the early 19th century. A lot of the times they had a specific religious affiliation. The Millerites were one such group who believed that the Second Coming was imminent, and so they lived in very close communities waiting for the Second Coming of Jesus. They were also doing this in response to the negative effects that they perceived from the market revolution. They believed that the wave of industrialization made people work a lot more and it made them greedier. So, living in a cooperative way in a utopia was an exit from that race to get more money. Another example of utopia movements are the Shakers. An image of them is on the slide. They got their name because in their religious worship, they would be very lively and get up and move around. Initially, they were nicknamed the Shaking Quakers, and they shortened it to just the Shakers. The interesting thing about the Shakers is that they practiced complete abstinence. They did not marry. The only way in which they got new members into the community was through recruitment. And because of this, they end up dying out in the early 1900s. The Utopian Society at New Harmony, Indiana, was created to try and relieve the pressure of the market revolution. And then the United Community in New York started for similar reasons, but financially maintained itself by selling finished goods made by their members. Most of these die out by the mid-1800s, partially because of conflict within the communities caused by disagreements on community decisions. In the case of the Shakers, they couldn't find more members to adhere to the beliefs of the utopian community. The second key concept covers the actual organizations that fuel the reform movement. Americans formed new voluntary organizations that aims to change individual behaviors and improve society through temperance and other reforms. The amalgamation of these different voluntary organizations together are what make up the reform era. One of the most important of these reforms was temperance, and the organization associated with it was the American Temperance Society. They believed that alcoholism and the drinking of alcohol was the cause for all the negative things in society and worked to get men to pledge to stop drinking and states to ban the sale of alcohol. They were successful in getting some state legislation passed that limited the sale of alcohol to certain times. They also had the support of factory owners because factory owners realized that their workers were going to be a lot more efficient and a lot less likely to have a workplace accident if they didn't come to work drunk. The movement in the 20th century is going to be successful in passing a constitutional amendment to end the sale and consumption of alcohol across the entire country. The image at the bottom is typical propaganda that the American Temperance Society would put out. It shows all of the steps that lead to someone's life being ruined as a result of alcohol. From the very first sip to the very bitter end that ends with death by suicide. The idea here is that one drink is going to lead to your demise. It's very reminiscent of the anti-smoking ads that are used today because they work on the same premise. Another reform movement that is popular during this time is the public asylum movement. A public asylum is a place where people can seek help who are mentally ill or have learning disabilities. A movement to improve the asylums for the mentally ill was proposed by Dorothea Dix. She found that people who were mentally ill or had disabilities would be put in cages or end up in jail. Some of the worst asylums she found chained patients to the beds and would be left to lie in their own filth. Dorothea Dix advocated for the creation of asylums or institutions that would treat people humanely as opposed to putting them through the further trauma. There were also reforms for poor houses, schools for the blind and deaf, prisons and penitentiaries. The Auburn system was trying to reform the prison system in a way that forces prisoners to do manual labor, in the way that you might think about a chain gang. There was a strong religious element to the Auburn system, and the reforms it implemented were meant to get prisoners to value hard work and think about what they've done, hopefully repenting afterwards. The name penitentiary, which is the name that starts to be used for prisons, 
comes from the word penance. Essentially, prisoners are paying their due or doing their penance for the crimes that they've committed so they can be reformed people once they leave. Another part of the reform era includes changes to public education. The movement for free public education that is tax-funded began in the early 1800s. Horace Mann is the person who was the main proponent of it. Other changes include a proposal for moral education taught in schools that had a stronger Protestant influence. As a response to this, there is a rise of private Catholic schools opening up. There are new religious-affiliated universities in the West. Some of them are starting to admit women, like Oberlin College. Finally, there is the rise of lecture circuits and lyceum societies. Lyceum societies were community organizations that would sponsor educational activities and bring in lecturers. This shows that people were trying to reform their mind or trying to become more educated. Ralph Waldo Emerson was one such lecturer that spoke at lyceum societies and traveled across New England, sometimes across to other parts of the United States. On one of his lecture circuits, when he was going through Boston, he actually stayed with the family of the famous poet Emily Dickinson. However, she was so shy that she would not come out of her room to greet Emerson. Other reform movements include the American Peace Society that opposed the Mexican-American War, the rise of phrenology, which is a pseudoscience that uses the study of the cranium as a way to figure out what's going inside of your head, and finally, dietary reforms to try to change the way that Americans eat. Out of this is where the graham crackers are invented, because they make people's digestive system work a lot more regularly. One of the biggest reform movements was the abolitionist movement, covered in the next key concept. Abolitionist and anti-slavery movements gradually achieved emancipation in the North, contributing to the growth of the free African-American population, even as many state governments restricted African-Americans' rights. The free African-American population at this point has grown to about 500,000, spread out evenly between the North and the South. Just because they were free did not mean that they had equal rights in the North or in the South. In fact, by virtue of being black, their skin color was automatically associated with slavery. So the burden of proof that they were free would be upon the emancipated person to show that they were in fact free. Often, freed people would have to carry pieces of paper like the one on the screen which was proof of manumission. Freed people still could not vote, would be barred from taking certain jobs that would earn higher wages. Sometimes they would be used against striking workers by bringing them in as scab workers. Once the strike was over, they would be fired. They were a source of cheap labor in the north, but they start to be replaced by immigrants as international migration grows. Those that were free in the south would often remain there to try and maintain their familial ties. There were harsher slave codes in the south because of previously failed enslaved insurrections, so southern freed people might experience greater harassment if they were mistaken for an enslaved person. In the state of Virginia, freed blacks were actually compelled to leave the state once they achieved their freedom. The next key concept is anti-slavery movements increased in the north. Abolition in the early 1800s begins with the American Colonization Society. This is an example of an organization that is trying to do good work, but maybe doing it in a way that operates under incorrect pretenses. They believe that all people who are enslaved should be free, but at the same time, they did not believe that they could viably stay in the United States and live amongst the white people. Therefore, they thought that it would be best if they sent the freed population to Africa and start a colony there. This was something that the British also tried in Sierra Leone, but the United States tried it in Liberia in the early 1800s, during the presidency of James Monroe. The capital of Liberia is still Monrovia, a city named after James Monroe. After the American Colonization Society, there is a rise of the American Anti-Slavery Society, founded by William Lloyd Garrison. Garrison was the publisher of the abolitionist newspaper called The Liberator. Garrison was a much more unabashed abolitionist. He was seen as very radical for his time. He advocated for the immediate emancipation of all enslaved people without any sort of compensation for their enslavers. He took on Frederick Douglass as a protege early in Douglass's career and sent them all across the North to lecture about how he got his freedom. Douglass, in his own right, became one of the most famous people in the entire 19th century. He was also the most photographed person in the 19th century. As in, there are more photographs of Frederick Douglass than any other person in the 19th century. When he traveled on his lecture tours, every time he arrived at a new town, the organizers of the speaking event would ask him to sit for a portrait. Since he was on the road for the majority of every year, he amassed hundreds of photographs. There were some people in the American Anti-Slavery Society that were not as radical as Garrison and would prefer a degree of compromise to gain progress on abolition. Some people left and created the Liberty Party. It ran political candidates for election. They actually ran their first presidential campaign in 1840, and they continued to do that until 1852. After that, they merged with other parties of similar ideology. The first famous black abolitionist is David Walker. He wrote An Appeal to the Colored Citizens of the World, in which he takes a radical stance for the day. 
that enslaved people should demand their freedom by any means necessary. His pamphlet was very feared in the South, as was much of the abolitionist literature. Thus, it was banned in many Southern states. Unfortunately, David Walker died very young, soon after the publishing of his pamphlet. After Walker, Frederick Douglass rises as the main black abolitionist voice. He starts his own abolitionist newspaper called the North Star, and will continue to be active in issues of civil rights into the last decade of the century, where he's even acting as a mentor to the next wave of civil rights advocates. Another major part of the reform era was the rise of a women's rights movement. The key concept says, a women's rights movement sought to create greater equality and opportunities for women, expressing its ideals at the Seneca Falls Convention. Women's roles changed during this time because of industrialization. Families were getting smaller, so women were gaining more time, and because they had more time, they would become involved in some of these reform movements. The women's rights movement didn't come about right away. First, women learned the methods of successful advocacy in other movements like the asylum movement, education, or abolition. These were acceptable movements for women to take part in. In the gender structure set by the cult of domesticity, women were to be moral anchors of the home. So if they were to venture beyond the realm of the home, it could only be done for something that fit their perceived role. Though it was an instance of discrimination inside of one of these movements that inspired the two most vocal advocates of women's rights to focus solely on women's rights. The women's rights movement was really started by Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. They began their advocacy as abolitionists, and when they attended an abolitionist convention in London, in which they were denied speaking privileges because they were women, they left and said that there needed to be more equality for women. Other female advocates were Margaret Fuller and Sarah Grimke, both writers. Fuller was a journalist, and Grimke published a book called Letters on the Equality of the Sexes and the Condition of Women, in which he gave a religious foundation for why women deserved equality. In 1848, the movement culminates with the Seneca Falls Convention, in which they issue the Declaration of Sentiments. This was a document that was modeled after the American Declaration of Independence, and in part mimics the wording of the original Declaration, but fixes the part where women were left out. Where Jefferson wrote that all men are created equal, the Seneca Falls Convention claimed that all men and women are created equal. All of the attendees of the Seneca Falls Convention are listed on the pamphlet on the screen. The ladies who attended at the top and all the gentlemen in the bottom, which include some famous advocates like Frederick Douglass. Alright, here's the recap. The Age of Reform began due to the Market Revolution, the Second Great Awakening, the expansion of democracy, and transcendentalist culture. Reform movements included temperance, education, and public asylum. Abolition grew as a result of the reform movement. And finally, the women's rights movement grew when women experienced inequality in other reform movements. Thank you for watching. If you would like to watch the next lecture, you can click on the video link on the screen. And if you're looking for more practice to help you on the AP exam, you can visit apushlights.com. I wish you the very best in all of your studying and look forward to seeing you back on the next lecture.